We are now going to talk about SSE pumps. And of course the question comes up, what does that mean? And which pump gets used where? Okay, so that's the questions that we're going to answer today. Okay, now, how many different types of water do we deal with with SSE? The answer is four. Four different types of water. Okay, so we're going to take a look here at some definitions. And in this first page of definitions, we're going to see those four different kinds of water. All right. So the first definition here is SSE. What does it mean? It means sump, sewage, and effluent. Some people like to say SES, and the reason they like to do that is they like to say sump, effluent, and sewage. One of the reasons why they say SES is because they're uh, putting them in order of solid size. Sump pump is half, effluent pump is three quarter, sewage pump is two inch so they put them in order uh, the guy that told me how to do it said SSE so that's the way I do it aerobic aerobic means to oxygenate and so when you have an aerobic system you are oxygenating uh, that system you're giving that system as much oxygen as you can okay anaerobic is the opposite Aerobic means we're going to use oxygen to kill off bad bacteria. Anaerobic means we're going to use good bacteria to kill off bad bacteria. Anaerobic takes place in the septic tank. So it's very important that we understand we're looking at the septic tank here. Okay? BOD. BOD stands for Biochemical Oxygen Demand. And what it is, is it's the amount of oxygen required uh, to kill off the bad bacteria. Okay, so we call that the BOD count. Now, those four types of water. Number one is clear water. Clear water is defined as rainwater runoff. Now, here in Wisconsin, we almost all have basements. Um, or crawl spaces and we're going to have a sump in that space that basement okay that sump is going to collect any rainwater that comes around the house so they'll put a they'll put a piping system around the house that has holes in it that's going to pull that water that seeps down into the ground into this sump pit and then we're going to pump it from the sump pit away from the house so that's clear water or rainwater runoff. Okay, gray water is non toilet water. This means if you take a shower, if you wash your dishes, if you wash your clothes, those are non toilet waters. Okay, and they're called gray water. Black water is raw human sewage. So you go to the bathroom, you flush the toilet, that's considered black water. And then the last type of water is called effluent water. Effluent water is partially treated wastewater. What it means is we're going to let the solid settle out. We're going to allow the soap and the oils to float to the surface. And what's between what we call the scum on the surface and the sludge on the bottom is called effluent water. More definitions. On-site system. This is a very important definition. Notice what it says. It is a natural system used to collect, treat, and discharge to a leach field. It includes the septic tank. Okay. On-site means that we're going to take care of the problem right here. We're not going to ship it someplace else to fix it. We're going to fix it right here. Septic tank. It's a container used to collect the wastewater. So when the water comes out of the house, because we want to separate those solids and that, uh, those oils and soaps from the effluent water, we collect them in a septic tank and then we can separate. A leach field is a subsurface land area, notice it says, with relatively permeable soil designed to receive pre-treated wastewater. That's the effluent water. 
So basically what happens is we take that effluent water, there's a couple different ways of delivering it to the leach field, but we deliver it to the leach field. Now we'll talk a little more about leach fields later on, but basically what a leach field does is it absorbs that water, cleans it up, so it gets rid of the last bit of bacteria that's in there. It uses an aerobic action to do so. Specific gravity. Specific gravity is the ratio of the density or substance to the density of pure water. Typically speaking, we consider um, wastewater to be pure water. So it's got a specific gravity of 1. TSS, total suspended solids. Total suspended solids is the amount of solids measured in the, the affluent water. Remember, we're considering up to three quarters of an inch as a solid. Okay, now the uh, next thing here is going to be scrubbing or scouring velocity. Now notice what it says. It's the speed of the water moving through the piping system to keep it clean. And notice that it says there is a minimum of two feet per second. So in a fresh water system, the slower the water goes, we could care less, okay? It's better to run it slow. But when you're moving water through a sewage system, and this is especially true of sewage, you want to make sure that that water is moving at a velocity of at least two feet per second. The reason for that is because two feet per second will help to scour or scrub the side walls of the inside of the pipe so that you don't get too much stuff uh, clinging to it and then wind up plugging up the pipe. All right. Squirt. Squirt is a measure of pressure used in an LPP system. LPP stands for low pipe pressure. And basically what squirt means is that when you set this LPP system up, you have to test that system to make sure that you have enough pressure, not too much, not too little. And so the inspector, before you bury that system, has you run fresh water through there, and he runs a test on it. But squirt means we're, we're checking that system to make sure it's right. HOA, HOA stands for Hand Off Auto. Uh, it's a toggle switch that is built into a control panel that is used to test the pump. So hand means I'm going to turn that pump on. I'm not going to let the automatic system uh, f do that. I'm going to put that on myself. Of course, if I turn it on, then I have to turn it off. And that's what off means is I'm going to turn it off. A means automatic. I'm going to allow the float system to decide when to turn the pump on and when to turn the pump off. Now, TNS is a similar type toggle switch. It is a double throw switch. And, of course, what it does is it has three settings. Test means that I am going to see if that alarm system works. N means normal. Normal means I'm going to allow the float to determine when the uh, alarm gets turned on and when it gets turned off. S means it's I'm there at the job site. The noise is so loud I can't stand it. And so I hit the S button. I flip that switch to S and that silences the audio part of the alarm. The visual part, the little red light or amber light, depending on which one I'm using, still works, but at least now the horn is turned off. Centrifugal pump. Centrifugal pump simply means it's the type of pump that we use to move water and create pressure. Now we're going to use centrifugal force to do that. Centrifugal force means to move something from the inside to the outside of a rotating body. Centrifugal type pumps have rotating bodies. Basically what a rotating body does is a rotating body will allow um, you to move from the inside to the outside of the impeller. And as you move that water through the impeller, you are increasing the velocity of that water.
okay so centrifugal force adds velocity to water head is our term for the energy content of the water especially in SSE head is considered a vertical uh, lift a vertical column and so how high is that vertical column of water that's the amount of head that the pump can produce now we go through uh, and do a couple of things shut off head is one thing that we do shut off head says let's find out or calculate the maximum head this pump can produce and we do that here in the factory with clean water kind of hard to do in the field with dirty water because you're going to plug that pressure gauge up and so with clean water you don't plug the pressure gauge so it's much easier to do here in the factory okay TDH is total dynamic head that's a measure of all the energy required by the system to accomplish the task that we want to accomplish in other words it takes into consideration is there any pressure required if I'm pumping into a city system it may be a pressurized city system and I have to overcome that pressure so at the curb stop I'm going to have to overcome pressure to get into that city system and so that's one thing I got to take into consideration friction loss how far away am I dumping this water that's friction loss and that friction loss can add up pretty quickly if we're not careful with our pipe sizing so uh, elevation difference from the off switch to the highest point I have to pump the water so those three things get added together and that makes my TDH flow rate or capacity is just looking at the volume of a liquid passing a given point in a specified amount of time we use the term gallons per minute when it comes to SSE we also use the term gallons per day and that's because when you go out to that leach field the um, inspector is going to tell you you can put this many gallons per day per square foot so that helps us to size that leach field up velocity is the amount of time required affecting a change in position basically what we're talking about here is the speed of the water how fast is the water moving through the piping system area is a space on a flat plane bordered by two lines this is something that you're using when you're calculating the area of the leach field okay you can also calculate the area of a pipe now the leach field is going to be length times width the pipe is going to be pi r squared now I want you to know that since most people talk about pipe as a diameter rather than a radius because pi r r means radius so since most people consider pipe as a diameter rather than a radius we use the uh, formula id squared times pi divided by four and you're going to get the same answer you'll get the same answer for that okay volume the contents of a space that is formed by lines that can be measured in three directions so once again if we look at that leach field we're going to look at the length times the width times the depth and it can be height or depth depending on how you want to look at it in a piping system it's going to be area times length little more involved in it that gives you cubic inches so what you're going to do then is you're going to change that by dividing those cubic inches by 1728 so you get cubic feet and then multiplying those cubic feet by 7.48 it's easier than that I'll show you atmospheric pressure the weight of the atmosphere at a given point at a given time it changes we know it does vacuum the measure of a pressure below atmospheric pressure it, vacuum is not necessarily the void of outer space sometimes we want to think of it that way but that's not it vacuum is something less than atmospheric pressure all right now let's get into pumps okay so the type of pumps that we're talking about here are battery backup pumps okay so you can see these pumps here are considered a battery backup system what they do is they back up your sump pump to make sure that should the electric go out you've got some type of protection at least for a while 
So you can see the different things that, uh, that we've got here and what's available to you. Some of them you'll notice are internet connected via Link 2.0. So you can connect some of these with Link 2.0, which means that you can look at your sump pump and see if it's working, if there's a problem, if you're out of electric at home, so that that way you can sometimes get those things fixed. Okay? Sump pumps themselves, now that was a battery backup, which was an extra pump that gets added to your sump. Some pumps yourself look like this. They're designed to pump clear or gray water, which means quarter to half inch solids. Okay? I like the piggyback float switch. Now, not all of them have that. We'll show you that in a second. But I like the piggyback float switch. What the piggyback float switch is this. You've got a float switch and you've got a pump plug-in. So you plug your pump plug-in into the back of your switch plug-in and then you plug that into the wall. Now what that means is if something happens and your pump quits working you can always just unplug this from the wall, unplug the pump from the float switch, plug the pump in and you've just made the simplest test that can be made to know is the switch bad or not. Because if that pump takes off, you got a bad switch. So just replace the switch. Okay? Here's what I'm going to tell you. Pumps are tested for about a million cycles. Switches are running somewhere around 350,000 cycles. So you could easily go through two to three switches during the life of a pump. So just because the pump doesn't work doesn't mean you should throw it out. Sometimes you just got to check that switch and see if it's the switch that's causing the problem. All right. Now, speaking of switches, you can get what is called a diaphragm switch. And you can see the diaphragm switch is mounted to the side of the pump. It works off of pressure. And so the water over the diaphragm switch is what turns that switch on. It is a very sensitive switch you're looking at probably less than a half a pound of pressure to turn that switch on. All right. The next switch we've got here is called a wide angle float switch or tethered float switch. And basically what we're doing here, you can see we've got the float switch tethered or tied off right to the handle of the pump. And then we're going to allow three and a half inches from that tether to the float. What that gives you is a seven inch swing to have that pump turn on and off. So you can pump seven inches of water. I will tell you that you can, with a little clip from a, a pliers, you can cut that and uh, you can attach that float wherever you want, which will give you more of a range. The reason that we attach them there at three and a half inches is because this basin required here is a minimum of a 14 inch basin. If you put it into a bigger basin you can allow for a bigger tether, uh, a longer tether, and what the longer tether is going to do is it's going to give you more action and the pump will turn on and off fewer times. The fewer times the pump turns on and off the longer it lasts. All right. And then our last type of switch here is called a vertical float switch. When you look at the vertical float switch, you'll see the float itself uh, is on that rod that, that uh, the float is going to move up. The rod's going to stay in place. The float's going to float up on the rod. When it gets up high enough, you can see there's that little square piece. The uh, round part is going to hit the square piece and lift it right up. So it's going to push that rod right up. As it pushes the rod up, that square piece has a magnet in there that is going to push up on the magnet and close the points. Once the points are closed, the pump gets turned on. Now, once the pump is turned on, what happens is the water starts to leave the basin. And as the water leaves the basin, the float starts to float down. When it gets down far enough, what happens, there's a stop on the very bottom. It lands on that stop, and then the weight of the float pulls the rod back down and of course that pulls the magnets in the other direction and opens that switch back up and turns the pump off. Now basically what you're looking at here is maybe a four to six inch range that you can move that water. Okay. 
this switch only gets used on sump pumps. You do not use this switch on any other pump. Okay. Other types of pumps here. And again, these are all uh, going to be sump pumps. So they're all designed for clear water. And you can see different uh, float switches here. You've got the vertical switch, flow switch on that one. You've got a tethered flow switch on this one. Um, these particular ones here, these two that we're looking at in the middle, um, are actually, uh, the, the, you can't see the, the plug in here, but they've got what's called a Y switch on them. And the Y switch means there's only one plug in. Now what happens here is the electric's going to come in, it's going to go to the switch, then it's going to come back this way down to the motor and then back up and out. So that's the way that the electric's going to move through here. The problem is if the switch goes bad, there's no way for you to tell that. So you can't just look at the uh, you can't just look at the switch and see well is it, is it working or not what you can do though is you can disassemble and you see the T handle there you can disassemble it and plug that uh, other float in there and run it that way this is just a test most guys don't like to do that so they just replace the pump at that point okay that's why I don't like single cord switches the other one over there again it's a float it's uh, not quite like a tethered float. Um, it's more like that vertical float. So you can see there's a stop on top. And what happens, it pushes up. Once it pushes up high enough, that flips the switch on, turns it on. And then, of course, once it comes back down, the uh, stop at the bottom catches it and turns it off. You can see, too, that we've got a vertical pump here. And we've also got a stainless steel pump. Now, utility pumps. The difference between a utility pump and a sump pump is there's only one cord. There's no float. These are non-automatic pumps. Non-automatic means you plug it in, you turn it on. If you want it off, you got to unplug it. So that's what non-automatic means. You can see, too, when you're looking at this one here, the very bottom of it, those legs allow only one sixteenth of an inch of water to move through there. Now what that means is you can pump that down really far. Okay, so you put that in a flooded basement, you can pump it almost all the way down. Okay, it, uh, it's designed to go into a window well, it's designed to go into a, a, uh, an aquarium. Better be a clean aquarium because if you've got stones at the bottom, it'll try and pull those stones in. That won't be good for the pump. All right. This is called a condensate pump. The, uh, the pump itself is extremely small. The catch for it is less than a cup. Where this gets used is in your AC. So usually inside your furnace vents there, there's, uh, your AC is hooked up. And of course your AC is going to drip. And as it drips, this catches those drips. And then it pumps that, that water over to a drain. So that's called a condensate pump. Here's another utility pump. People call this a ditch pump. Because what you do is you connect to the suction and the discharge. And you throw the suction hose into a ditch and you, you pump out the ditch. Now you can see this one has a roll cage on it. So you can get them with a roll cage or without a roll cage. And then this little pump that I just brought up is probably one of the most popular pumps that we sell. Again, it's used for things like water beds and aquariums and stuff like that. Um, the key to remember here, where the suction goes into the pump there, before you connect that suction hose, you must take a tablespoon of vegetable oil. It has to be vegetable oil. You put the vegetable oil in that hole, then connect the hose, then plug the pump in. Now the reason for that is because oil has a higher viscosity than water, and so it kind of sticks to the impeller as the impeller is turning, and that creates a vacuum which pulls the water in then. 
so you don't have to prime that pump. Otherwise, you got to prime the pump to get it to work. But you put that vegetable oil in there, boom, she takes right off. And, of course, once the water starts going through there, it washes the vegetable oil out. So you have to put the vegetable oil in every time you want to use the pump. These are called effluent pumps, all right? Now, remember, some pumps half and three-quarter, excuse me, one-quarter and, and half solids, okay? So some pumps are one-quarter and half-inch solids. Effluent pumps are three-quarter inch solids. And again, what you're seeing here is a three-quarter inch leg, all right? You'll notice this pump has a extra piece in it. That intermediate piece allows you to put in a double uh, mechanical seal. Now, a double mechanical seal means that that motor is extremely protected. And so that's basically what you're doing here is you are... Um, sealing that motor off and protecting that motor so you want to make sure that you keep that motor protected all right um you'll notice too in that intermediate piece that there's a pipe plug all right what's important about that pipe plug is the fact that these are oil-filled motors and when you have that intermediate piece you also need to put oil in there because you've got to lubricate the top mechanical seal. I'm going to show you that in a little bit, how it all gets put together. All right? These are called step pumps. Step pumps. And the step pumps, as you can see here, they have to use a special SJO approved cord. You, basically, they're a 4-inch submersible from the residential pump line but you can't use just that four inch wire you have to use a special sjo approved wire on it some step pumps most step pumps have the suction in the middle of the pump it's a four inch submersible that's where the suction is on a four inch submersible there is a special pump that we sell though that has the suction at the bottom that means that the motor is in the top and, of course, what you're doing is you're encapsulating that motor so that you push the water around the motor. Now, of course, with most step pumps, if you run them for more than 15 minutes, that pump is going to trip on overload. With that uh, pump on the right-hand side, that's not going to happen, okay? Because you're cooling that motor as you're discharging that water, all right? Sewage pumps. Sewage pumps are designed to pump 2-inch solids. Now notice they have a 2 or 3-inch discharge. You can get them with a flange or with just a, a drilled and tapped hole. What are the advantages of the flange? With a flange pump, you can keep one pump in stock. You can keep a 2-inch flange, and you can keep a 3-inch flange, and you can sell the flange to the pump. So a customer comes in and says, I want a pump with a 2-inch discharge. You sell them the pump and the 2-inch flange. If they come in and say, I want a pump with a 3-inch discharge, you sell them a pump and a 3-inch flange. It's much cheaper to inventory two flanges than it is to inventory two pumps. So that's what the advantage of a flanged pump. Now you'll notice sewage pumps, because they pump 2-inch solids, they have 2-inch legs so that a 2-inch solid can get under there. By the way, just so you understand, that 2-inch solid is a spherical solid. Okay? It's round. You can get them with a switch or without. If you get them without a switch, they are considered manual. If you get them with the switch, they're considered automatic. When you're doing a duplex system, you want a manual pump. You do not want an automatic pump when you're doing a duplex system. So just remember that, okay? There's your flange discharge on there. There's two bolts holding it on. So easy to change. And, of course, what that means is you can put that 2 or 3-inch flange on there. And like I say, that saves on your inventory cost quite a bit, okay? Grinder pumps. We have what's called a V1 and a V2, 
and they are um, a one horse and a two horsepower grinder pumps. Grinder pumps are designed to take the waste that's in there and chop it up into a slurry. And so you get a slurry out of it. All right. Notice you're going to have a handle. That's how you pick the pump up and down. You do not pick the pump up and down by the cord. Never, ever pick a uh, pump up by its cord. All right. Right there on the side of the pump is your pipe plug for your oil. Again, oil-filled motors. And so that's about how high the oil is going to go in there. Okay. So that's an oil-filled motor, and that's your pipe plug. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is you can see some bolts on the bottom, and if you take those bottom bolts out, you can lift that motor cap right off of the uh, seal plate and uh, volute case. Of course, if you do that, you're going to have oil all over everything. And that's why I'm pointing out that oil plug there, that, that uh, pipe plug. What you want to do is take that pipe plug out, tip the pump over, and catch the oil. Number one, it will tell you how good a shape that motor's in. If the oil is clean, the motor's still in pretty good shape. If the oil is dirty, you have a problem with your motor. So it's a good indicator. Number two, you have oil to put back in without having to buy more oil. By the way, the oil that's used there is a dielectric oil. Dielectric which means you can put it in and turn on that electric motor and it's not going to hurt the motor. Okay, so that's the dielectric oil that goes in there. Again, you're going to have legs. Now, you could have legs or you could use a lift-out guide rail system. It depends on uh, what you prefer to do. Some of these pumps, especially these two horsepowers, can get pretty heavy. And if they get too heavy, you may want to use a lift-out guide rail system on them. This is a waste handler or sewage ejector pump. This pump is used, uh, the, the sewage pumps that we saw earlier look very similar to this, but the sewage pumps uh, only go up to 2 horsepower, and they're used primarily in residential applications. This pump here is 1.5 to 5 horsepower, and it gets used in lift stations. Okay, now there are bigger pumps for bigger lift stations. They get sold through a different division, so my division cannot sell those pumps. That's called applied wastewater, but we can sell up to a five horsepower pump. You can get the discharge vertical or horizontal, you can get it drilled and tapped, or you can get it flanged. It's up to you. They range from solid size here, ranges from 2.5 to 3 inch. So your, sump, your sewage pumps, rather, only do 2 inch. Your waste handler can do 2.5 to 3 inch. So your openings there are going to be 3 and 4 inch, just so you understand that. Okay? They do require a control panel. These are non-automatic pumps. So what that means is you must buy a panel to put with this pump okay um, lift out guide rail system you can see there are different types it all depends on the type of pump that you've got all right you're going to have two rails and those rails are there to guide the movable flange on okay so there's your movable flange your pump is going to attach to the movable flange and now you can lift that movable uh, you can pull that pump up and the movable flange keeps it in the same point it's not swinging all over the place plus when you put it back down that movable flange sets it right where it needs to be so it connects to the discharge pipe and there's your discharge pipe there okay here's your chain that you're going to use to lift it up and down Lift-out guide rail systems need to be attached to the top and bottom of your basin. Uh, sometimes you'll need an intermediate there also. All right, There's the movable portion. Right here is your intermediate. Okay. Now, the point again being is this. If you want a lift-out guide rail system in your basin, it would be to your advantage to let us do it when we make the basin. 
So order that with the basin and we can put it all together for you. Otherwise, you've got to have special bolts because remember, uh, most, uh, most of your inspectors are not going to want water dripping out of the bottom of that basin. So you got to make sure that that is sealed. All right. And then, of course, here's another type where you've got your discharge going up and out. Okay, here's your, they're using a cable here, a, a steel cable instead of a chain to lift it out. All right, the bottom line is it allows you to bring the pump up and set the pump back down and connect your discharge piping without disturbing all your discharge piping. So there's a huge advantage to using a lift out guide rail system. Okay, this is another type of lift out guide rail system. It's used for bigger pumps. So, um, I'll tell you a true story. One time I had a guy from uh, the, the Bermuda come up one time, and he was sitting in my class back when we were doing uh, SSE during our water systems classes. And he said to me, You know, Bill. He said, I worked on a system one time. The basin was 10 foot wide by 30 foot deep. I thought, wow, that's a big system. He said, yeah, it was in, a, uh, it was in an all-inclusive hotel. And he said, both pumps died at the same time, and they didn't have a lift-out guide rail system in place. And I said, Chris, do you mean to tell me that you had to back a truck in there and pump it out before you get down there and fix it? He said, nope. We were in a sub-basement. You couldn't get a pumper truck down there. Chris, you mean that you bail this whole thing by hand so you could get down in there and fix them? He said, nope. Couldn't bail it by hand either. I said, Chris, what did you do? And he said, I'm a scuba diver. And he actually put on a scuba gear and went down. Now you got to remember, there's eight bolts here. Without a lift-out guide rail system, those eight bolts are, dis are bolted right to the discharge pipe. So he had to take those eight nuts and bolts off of there without getting hit by the pump, because that pump weighs a lot, get the pump up out of there, and then go do the second pump. When he's all done and they got the pumps fixed, guess what he's got to do? Go back down and put them back in. I said, Chris, I hope you charged them more than what a lift-out guide rail system would have cost them. Because, boy, that's one way to teach them. Okay, so you can see there's your movable flange. And you're going to have a, a bull ring here to lift that pump out with. Okay, there's your uh, guide rails and your discharge connection here. Okay, now, mechanical seals. I talked about mechanical seals before, and I want to finish up that conversation now. When you look at mechanical seals, this is a single seal pump. So you can buy the pump single seal, you can buy them with a double seal. A single seal pump is going to have a, uh, a couple of parts to it. All right, there's a retaining washer, retaining ring, and the seal itself. And then sometimes they call them a double seal pump because they're going to put a lip seal in there too. A lip seal is more of a filter than anything else. When you put the seal together, this is what it looks like. Here's your mechanical part of the seal that's going to go in there first. Okay, now that part is going to get glued in so you can see you put Permatex on the outside of it. All right, then you push it down into place and that Permatex seals. All right, now you've got your ceramic part that you're going to bring down and set your ceramic part on there. Now the ceramic part is the movable portion. So it's going to really fit tightly to that shaft so it can move along with the shaft. Then what you're going to do is be careful as you're putting it down. Because as I say, there's a rubber ring in there that's going to attach it to the shaft. And if you break that rubber ring, you're going to have a leaky seal. So be careful going over that clip area there so that you don't cut the rubber ring. Now, in the fifth figure here, we've seated it. Now we're going to bring our clip in place. And you set that clip, you bring that clip down, and it goes right in here. And you can see it's going to hold that uh, movable portion in place and actually turn with it. Okay. Now the last thing here, we've created this open area. What we're going to do is we're going to close that area with a seal that 
like I say, this, this seal is more of a filter than a real seal. And what it does, it gives you a clean area. So you're not going to get garbage to get up there and get caught in your mechanical seal. Okay? A true double seal pump has that intermediate in there. So you've got your motor part here. You've got your um, volute case seal plate there. And then you've got your intermediate here. All right? One mechanical seal, two mechanical seals. Now remember, the bottom mechanical seal is being lubricated by... Uh, water, the top mechanical seal is going to be lubricated by oil, and that's why you've got that oil pipe plug in there. All right, and then you've got sensors in there, and that's the whole purpose of putting in the double mechanical seal so you can put the sensors in. And the sensors tell you if water should happen to get into this intermediate. They send a signal up, and what they do basically is when the water gets high enough to touch the sensor it shorts the sensor out. A pump is a real simple piece of equipment. It's got a driver, it's got an impeller, and it's got a volute case. That's, that's the three major parts of a pump. So it's really quite simple. You've got to have something to drive it. Typically speaking, it's an electric motor. You're going to use the impeller to increase the velocity of the water. You're going to use the diffuser to change that velocity into pressure. So you can pressurize the water. I'm going to break this pump down for you, and we'll look at all the little parts in there. Okay. Number one is your uh, cord, your plug-in cord. Now remember, you may have a float cord separate, but your plug-in cord for your pump, this is your power cord to your pump. It goes right to the motor. There's going to be a grommet there. So number two is your grommet. Typically speaking, it's made out of plastic. This is one reason why you never want to lift a pump by the cord. Because if you lift it by the cord, you can break that grommet, and now you've got to buy a new one. Okay. Number five is your motor cap. Typically, they're made out of uh, cast iron, but you could have them made out of stainless. You could have them made out of plastic. Um, so that's your motor cap. It sits over your motor and keeps the water from getting into the motor. Number three is your bull ring. That's how you're going to lift your pump. You always lift the pump with the bull ring. Okay. Number four is your pipe plug. So that way you can put the oil in and take the oil out. Remember, any time you're going to take a pump apart, you want to make sure that you take that oil out first for two reasons. One, it helps you to know what's going on inside that motor because you get to look at that oil to see is it clean or is it dirty. And number two, most importantly, you don't have to report an oil spill to the EPA. All right. Number seven there is a capacitor. It might be a starting capacitor. It might be a running capacitor. It all depends on whether your motor is split capacitor or if it is a capacitor start induction run. If it's capacitor start induction run, that'll be a starting capacitor. If it is a permanent split capacitor motor, PSC motor, it will have a running capacitor in there. Number nine. Now, you'll notice number nine includes the motor. It includes the stator, the rotor, and the cap. And the cap is there strictly to keep that rotor in a vertical position. Um, number eight are the screws that are going to hold the motor down in place. Number 11 is the seal plate adapter. The seal plate adapter means I can, I can uh, disassemble that part of the pump and take it off without opening up that cap, that motor cap, all right? Or I can take the motor cap off and pull it all apart. It's, it's up to me what I want to do there. Number 10 is the O-ring that's going to go down between the motor cap and the seal plate to make sure that I seal all that oil in there, all right? 12 A and B are the mechanical seal. 13 is the impeller. 14 is the volute case. Number 16 is the float. Remember, the float can be a tethered float. It can be a diaphragm float when you're talking a sewage pump. If you're talking a sump pump, you could even use a vertical float on it. 
So we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you very much.